welcome everybody to the book launch um, for Carlos Samet's new chat book, What is Left? Um, very excited to have you all here today with us. My name is Brian Sonia Wallace. I am the current Poet Laureate of the City of West Hollywood. Um, and this event is part of our WeHo Read series. So if you look out every month through the year, uh, West Hollywood hosts uh, emerging and established voices uh, doing the good work today. I um, want to acknowledge that here in the city of West Hollywood, we are on uh, native Tongva land, giving our respect and appreciation for that. Enjoying seeing um, all of the incredible uh, metaphors for how folks are doing in the chat. Um, it sounds like we've got some slots, we've got a lot of cats, we've got some big dogs. Um, all of those things are fantastic. Um, would love to encourage everyone to really use the chat as folks are reading. They may not be able to see it while they're reading, but afterwards, it's so gratifying for writers to hear your favorite lines, to know what you thought about it. So even though we're in this Zoom space, would love to, <laughs> and we're not forgetting the bears, Maria Elena. Um, even though we're in the Zoom space, really encourage you to be as, as interactive as you want to be. Um, for right now, what I would love uh, is to take a quick photo of all of us before we get this show on the road. So if you want to throw your cameras on for a moment, you're welcome to turn them off later. If you have your copy of what is left, I would love to see your copy of what is left. And if you don't have it, something tells me uh, that Colette may put it in the chat so that you can order it. Um, and big thanks to Colette for co-hosting and they will be uh, our chat moderator and host for today. So go ahead, hold those books up. I'm gonna get that selfie in three, two, one. Whoa. All right, <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we have a really incredible lineup of readers for you here today. Um, really excited and and there's people still coming in, but we're going to go ahead and kick things right off. I'm going to introduce our first reader for the day. Um, they are incredible. Um, I know them in the same way, actually, that I know Carlo, which is through the Pride Poets cohort. We write poems one on one for the public uh, every year during Pride. So look out for us in uh, June of this year as well. Uh, Jaira Dang. Uh, is a queer Asian American poet and journalist born and raised in the San Gabriel Valley. Their work appears in the Asian American Writers Workshop, the podcast VS, LA Taco, the Human Rights Campaign, TaiwaneseAmerican.org, and more. Um, current student at CSU Long Beach and uh, on the Student Advisory Board, they're the representative for the Asian American Journalist Association's Los Angeles chapter. And in the summer of 21, they interned at the LA Times and are currently interning at NPR. Definitely a voice that you're going to be hearing a lot more of. Uh, when they're not writing, you can find them cooking noodles or fried rice for loved ones. Please give a warm welcome to our first reader for Carla's book launch, Jaira Dang. Seeing you again. Over the reckoning of last year, I've turned 19 to 21, watching womanhood arrive from the windows of my childhood home, taking in the sunset's bruised haze. I pine for the subway upheaval of a city that could kill me. I've grown grateful for the rush hour traffic on the 101, the smog browning the Sierra's tips, calcifying my lungs. In quarantine, my body has become a flag of need. I confess to having fallen in love with strangers in the backdrop of their bedrooms. Through the dimmed light of a Zoom screen, we are relearning tenderness in the human gaze. This uncertainty is a blessing. Small talk we took for granted, now breathing each other's words with consequence. I ask my friends to tell me, where their sadness creeps between sleep and work, because I'm trying to write where a cough is just a throat clearing, and we bloom fresh produce from the community garden. Yes, 
There's a future where the choice are you and I gathered together, all our familiar edges, elbows rubbing, like hands instinctively rise to cup a lover's head between your palms. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, it is so wonderful just to see everyone in this um, Zoom call celebrating Carla's new book release. Um, a book is like a baby, like <laughs> it really takes a lot of time to put together that much time and effort and sometimes it can be a lonely journey and so I'm so glad we're here to celebrate Carla and her newest book. Um, and so in keeping in line with the theme of like, you know, pride poets and all the queerness, all the queer energy in this Zoom space, even though we can't be next to each other. Um, yeah, we can celebrate that still. Um, this next poem is called, This Body Is Not a Virus. This body is not a virus after, after Fatima Ashgar. I'm dreaming of new futures where I claim the women who work the massage parlors, the fathers and mothers who leave behind continents then pass down languages to their children. I'm blessing us gays, theys, and bays who kiss in open streets or shuttered behind closed doors. I'm thanking my fight over the Czech aunties and uncles who drop off secondhand clothes and homegrown fruit. I call my people borderless when friends fly away and green cards fail to grow on trees. I'm here for the tragedy when another life is taken and when no metaphors can cup the loss, I pray for words to hold us all. I pray words will never be enough. My mouth has been the exit wound of my family tree. I'm asking you to make it your altar, an offering of love and laughter to tide us through the storm and calm. The revolution in our hearts demands our pause. Stop dredging up those kingdoms and let your joy do the work. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so that poem, um, just a little bit of a side note, was kind of written in response to like all the craziness, I think, during the pandemic. And man, pandemic poetry <laughs> really, is a lot and I think in keeping in line with like Carla's poems and how all of that energy being translated into her current collection it's it's such a blessing to be writing in community and to find community in online spaces like these so thank you so much for being here again um this next poem I want to read for you all uh is called girl in isolation and it's after Olivia Gatwood's Instagram page, collaging self-portraits of girls in isolation. While she was away at college, the blankets increased in her absence. The books on her shelves peeled themselves open to imitate the sensation of fingers thumbing pages. The clothes in her drawers wandered to remember movement and air. In the month she's been home, the backyard lemon tree and green onions have no idea what to do with a teenager sprawled in St. Augustine, or when she throws rocks into her neighbor's backyard to scare the squirrel teething on telephone wires. They reason her roots are not transplanted yet. The steel frame of her bed grumbles under her shifting weight at all hours of the day. Her stories collect dust. The drawers are in riot. She hasn't changed her sweat in four days. Toothbrush has been released of plaque scraping duties for the week. Then the poems spill from the baby blue walls to pool in her arms and tell her to drink. There is a soft rebirthing where she draws the liquid and strength required to let herself cry. Um, I think it's fitting that one is kind of uh, a pandemic poem about being in isolation at home um, and because I'm reading from my childhood house right now <laughs> in my parents house in the San Gabriel Valley um, and I think what is um, 
really inopportune is that I did not know the pandemic was going to happen. So I like came out to my entire family during the pandemic. And then I was stuck for the next 17 months with them in isolation at home. So for all my people who made it through this pandemic as queer folks, um, we did it. We're still going through it, but we're, we're doing it and we're doing amazing and we're here. Um, yeah, and I think with the pandemic, I was thinking a lot about, you know, what it means to like exist in this like liminal space where people see you, but they also don't see you. And then like, what are those boundaries? And then like, what does it mean when I show up into spaces? Like I can still feel, I think some level of like um, perception that people put on me, even when I'm in a Zoom call. And so I wrote this one and it's called um, Object Permanence. And I'm going to, yeah, I'll just jump right into it. When I reach, it just escapes me. Falling in perpetuity between the precipice of home and foreign oceans. When I walk into a room, how do I name myself? The celestial being, a flashing beacon in the night. The stalwart embrace, a rooted tree knotted around the eroded cliffside. A shift in weight and the sea rises, the mountains fall. Such things hold the bias, a stake in the future. How long has it been since someone, someone has touched me? Caress the flat planes of my face, kiss the almonds of my eyes, crawl under the yellow flush of my skin. Will you have me as strong-willed and unbending as others prefer, where I am always lost, never found? I'm begging you not to look away. I'm on my knees interceding to the gods of tomorrow. End of sorrow, abolish peril, end of want, abolish fruit and labor. My siblings and I meet, touching as cherubim, before our reflection and bless that image holy. Thank you so much, everyone. You should unmute for a minute. And... The floodgates. <laughs> Thank you, Jaira, so much. And Jaira, before you, uh, before you run away, you just uh, had a chat book, and I want you to talk about that. And I want you to put a link in the chat, if you don't mind, please. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, I was like, on a Sunday when I was supposed to be doing finals work, was like, you know what? I have all these poems that got published over the past year. And I know that I need to just like slap it together. So <laughs> um, what I did was I went on InDesign and then like put together a bunch of like actually film photos that I took over the pandemic and also some collages that I made. And um, yeah, and then I think it's special cause it's all like photos of my family and the film camera belonged to my, my grandfather. So um, if you want a copy, please support Carlos book and support your local poets. So I'll drop a link in the chat. So thank you so much. Thank you, Zara. Oh man, let's keep these readings going. This next reader, um, I am still mad at. They just got back from Berlin. They had too good of a time. They had a poetry film that premiered at a film festival there. I can't even. <laughs> um, Victor Yates is a writer, storyteller, and performance artist. Uh, his digital Black Lives Matter spoken word performance death sentence uh, received grants from both the city of West Hollywood and Glendale. Um, he also uh, got a grant to shoot a documentary recording narratives of older gay men, was selected for the Fire Island Artist Residency, and is the winner of the 2020 George Floyd Honorarium for Poetry from the Los Angeles Press. A uh, couple accolades, 2017 Judith A. Markowitz Emerging uh, LGBT Writers Award, 2016 Lambda Literary Award for LGBT Debut Fiction for his book, A Love Like Blood. Whatever, Victor. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Victor Yates. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the reading. Um, I am so excited to be here right now. And so again, my name is Victor Yates, and I'm reading from Death Sentence, which is a collection of poems 
that deal with police brutality against black bodies. And so the first poem that I'm going to read is Strange Truths or Six Days After Andrew Brown Was Murdered, the New York Post wanted you to know he had a rap sheet over 180 pages. Page one, checked boxes like blood on the leaves, haunt families for centuries. Page two, patty rollers on horseback formed in the Carolinas using blood on the root, policed black bodies, the other colonies followed suit. Page three, the number of slaves bathed in blood memories exceeded whites in North Carolina in 19 counties when strange truths hung from trees. Page four, in Elizabeth City, a columned monument with gray back granite topper offered our heroes to black youth led in in handcuffs. Page five, a little girl's mother instructed her, run when you see a blue X in rust. Page six, no longer a girl, the mayor shrank. Salt water to trees, seeing the twisted mouths waving in the southern breeze. Page seven, four seconds passed from the mob arriving to rifles firing. Page eight, 44 seconds passed from the mob arriving to Brown being pulled from his tree. Page nine, black man shot dead, had a 30 year rap sheet dating back to 88, the article read. Page 10, Brown was nine in 88, a child, but the cop skimming the article howled, giddy seeing the trees his ancestor planted. The next poem that I'm going to read is untitled. Um, I'm really bad at titling poems sometimes, so I'm still thinking about what I wanna title this one. The first time someone called me the N-word was in West Hollywood. When I was 16, my mother told me, smile while my photo was taken at the DMV. If I was stopped, the police wouldn't think I was threatening. To be young, gifted, and Black means nothing at 12 a.m. and a cop pulls you over. At a nightclub on Santa Monica, a white man kicked me in the back. Security kicked me out. He owned the club. In 1969, if you were black, you had to show three picture IDs to set foot into the clubs. I'm not young anymore, and I haven't had anything to smile about in months. We're taught from the moment we leave the house to remember we're black. Blackness is enough to be attacked. Some nights at 3 a.m., I wake up to a wingtip stuck in my back. Yeah. This next poem is, is also untitled. To exhibit skill, English archers shot arrows through the eye socket of a bull's skull. The first Target store opened in the suburbs of St. Paul, Minnesota in 1962. It's no use going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. In 2016, Philando Castile was murdered for being black and suspicious. I wasn't reaching for it was all they heard before there were no sounds. The cop holding a gun felt threatened. Horns unlike antlers are an extension of the skull and usually found on both males and females. To live in a black body means balancing hundreds of skulls on your head to allow in other burdens. A cop locked his kneecap into George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, killing him in Minneapolis. 
Across the country, riots broke out following attacks at the hands of the police in 1967. It was called the Long Hot Summer. It's kind of Alice in Wonderland with the same moving picture reshown over and over again. So when the bull's eye burned during the protests, no one had to tell me. My skull itched from the shock of new bones when smoke filled my home. Thank you so much. Um, I have to unmute for this. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for bringing that voice and that consciousness um, into this reading. Uh, <laughs> Julie Schaefer said overpowering, which I love as a, an adjective and a descriptor. Um, I yeah. didn't get I didn't get the bunch of skulls on the head. What did you mean by that? So with the skulls, um, I wanted to I wanted people to think about um, various burdens that marginalized groups are holding on to. So as a black gay man, I um, carry the burdens of my ancestors. Um, as a queer person, I carry the burdens of all of the people that came before me. And so I wanted to also, uh, for people to think about uh, the, an actual like um, animal skulls and bone um, as kind of like a way to represent all of that. Thanks. Thank you, James. Thank you, Victor. Um, our next reader, Sima Reza, is the author of A Constellation of Half-Lives and When the World Breaks Open. Based in Maryland, she has led writing workshops within correctional facilities, military and civilian, civilian hospitals, elementary and secondary schools and universities. She's the CEO of Community Building Artworks, a unique arts organization that encourages the use of the arts as a tool for narration, self-care and socialization among a military population struggling with emotional and physical injuries. Reza's work with veterans is featured in the 2018 HBO documentary, We Are Not Done Yet. An alumna of Goddard College and Vona, she has had writing online and in print in McSweeney's, the LA Review, the Feminist Wire, the Offing and Entropy among others. Please give a warm welcome to Seema. Woohoo, Seema! I'm so, 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 so happy to be here. So excited to celebrate this book, um, this really extraordinary collection by Carla and, and grateful to be with all of you. Um, I'm dialing in from Maryland. I know we got a lot of California people, so it's a little later here um, from the, um, from land belonging to the Piscataway people, um, some of the first people in the Western hemisphere. Um, I'm going to share a couple of poems with you um, that I felt kind of echoed some of the themes and ideas that Carla's work um, always brings up. I'm grateful to write with Carla almost every week. And uh, so this is the first poem is called 36 and it begins with two epigraphs. A lifetime isn't long enough for the beauty of this world and the responsibilities of your life. That's Mary Oliver. And this is Adrian Rich. Madness, suicide, murder. Is there no way out but these? One, I've reached the age at which my grandmother left seven wailing children to grow old and plump in the absence of her shadow. Every day, the quickening pulse of my urge to dissolve. I haven't got the guts, so odds are tomorrow will knock on my eyelids, demanding I open up 
and answer the phone, the emails, tear envelopes, crush coffee beans too. None of it matters not the books I've read or pretended to read, not the vanished labor of dinners and laundry and lust returned or refused, or the ungrateful row of orchids whose withering stalks I water faithfully, though they refuse to bloom. Three, what will happen to my beautiful things, my daring ideas, my ordinary hungers? my heavy pots and precious metals? Who will tidy the messes I've left, the cluttered exuberance of my dumb human life? My, who will clear the debris of my desire, my jagged plans for vengeance? Not you, with your own stacks and sweaters and socks, your filing cabinets of tax returns, your collected legacy of love and gracelessness as important as mine, which is to say, not important at all. Four, open-armed leap, cyanide, gun to temple, weighted pocket slide into river or lake or pond or bathtub, lungs filled with gas, fist full of pills, needle to the arm, laying on train tracks, running barefoot into traffic. I haven't got the guts. Five. When I lived in the dark row house in the suburbs, I woke each morning and brought the yeast to life under the correct conditions. Warm water, a spoon of sugar, allowed it to breathe and expand covered, then punched it, placed its heavy bottle body in a shallow metal pan, let it rise again, chastened, turned it solid in the tomb of the oven. Whether or not the yeast behaved as expected, we ate and were full until we were hungry again, then started new yeast and consumed that too. Tell me, how am I different from this? Tell me, are you? Six, you joined and divided in the dark, arrived glistening, gasping, thirsty and dumb, keen to survive. Closed your gums around the dark point of my milk plump breast. I allowed you. I should have blocked your airways with my palm and spared you. The burning, drowning, wild and concrete places, the cracking and sinking earth, the looming glass landscapes. I offer you umbrage, a warm coat, ice cream, cherries, and the pleasure of spitting pits. I show you the angled legs of crickets, tadpoles swarming in the shallow, the blue heron stalking fish, the dwindling whales through binocular sights, knowing you are the best thing here until you are consumed. I prop you at this table and I'm glad for your company. Thanks guys. I'm gonna read one more um, from the same book. This is from A Constellation of Half-Lives. Um, and the poem I'm gonna read is, you know what? We just celebrated my mom's birthday today. And I'm gonna read a poem um, that she's just like, why did you write this? Which is like most of my writing. I think this is the thing about moms. So I read one about sons and this one's about moms. It's called 1995. Um, so here we go. You can tell an American child by their shoes. Americans keep their shoes dirty, but a child just trying to look American will keep her sneakers pristine. My mother is full of observations of white Americans and brown ones like me, American to spite their parents. Sometimes she thinks they, we, have no loyalty or generosity or cooth. Other times she says they are clean, but still. I am not to share their pants or sit on their toilets. She warns, they wear their shoes all over the house. Their dining tables are cluttered with papers because they don't eat food. Americans, my mother tells me, 
don't care about their mothers. Whatever they might say, they think less of us. She warns me and I don't believe her. When yet another American boy discards my heart in favor of one who I'm sure does not have hair on her knuckles, she says. I don't know why you're so hopeful and soft-hearted. It's not my fault. Thank you all. Thank you, Carla, for inviting me here. Excited to hear the rest of the reading. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Seema. Oh my goodness, what an introduction to your work. I hadn't heard Seema read before and now I just have to take a minute. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, that was incredible and gorgeous. Um, whew. Let's keep things moving on. Um, this was my, my introduction to Seema. This next reader who's coming up, um, I think was, was definitely like top five favorite books that I read this last year. Um, and I'm so excited for uh, his second one, Chen Chen's second book of poetry, Your Emergency Contact Has Experienced an Emergency, uh, is forthcoming from Boa Editions in September 2022. And his first book, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Further Possibilities, uh, was longlisted for the National Book Award and won the Tom Gunn Award uh, along other, uh, alongside other honors. Um, his works appeared in many publications, including, including three editions of the Best American Poetry. He teaches at Brandeis University and also serves on the poetry faculty for the low residency MFA programs at the New England, uh, at New England College and Stone Coast. Um, Chen Chen, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, so glad to be here. Um, is this recording going to be posted somewhere? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I keep changing my mind about what to read just based on hearing everybody's um, wonderful work um, and thinking about what I want to bring into conversation with everybody. Um, I think I will read super new poems um, that don't appear anywhere because <laughs> uh, that's just what I feel like doing. Um, but first, I want to share this poem by uh, Linda Gregg that I just keep thinking about. Um, I'll put a link in the chat if you want to follow along. <clears throat> so this is called Let Birds by Linda Gregg. Eight deer on the slope in the summer morning mist, the night sky blue, me like a mare let out to pasture. The tau does not console me. I was given the way in the milk of childhood, breathing it, waking and sleeping. But now there is no amazing smell of sperm on my thighs, no spreading it on my stomach to show pleasure. I will never give up longing. I will let my hair stay long. The rain proclaims these trees, the trees tell of the sun. Let birds, let birds, let leaf be passion, let jaw, let teeth, let tongue be between us, let joy, let entering, let rage and calm join, let quail come, let winter impress you, let spring, allow the ocean to wake in you. Let the mare in the field in the summer morning mist make you whinny, make you come to the fence and whinny. Let birds. Okay, so I'm gonna read super new work. Um, okay. So this first one's called November. It is Tuesday. My ancestor and I play table tennis. My ancestor is very good. I have little hope of winning. It is Tuesday in November, the Tuesday of months, the February of fall. Ancestor, I say, how did you get so good at this game? My ancestor shrugs, says, how do you still not know my name? Tuesday, once you were my favorite name in the set of nameable time, now you're a set of hours, each more lime sour than the last, and there is no last, only more rhyming with lose, loss, loser. 
My ancestor wins again. I had no hope. I have no. I lie down only to discover I'm falling. It is November. How long have I been falling? How long have I been the longest to stay? Ancestor, I say, what can I offer without hope? What can I say or do, play or feel now? My ancestor is very quiet, then lies down next to me, falls with me. You can grieve, my ancestor says. You can feel everything, everything you've lost. Uh, this next one is called January. I am in bed. I'm having a journey that calls itself life when it is insomnia. So I read. I read three pages of a dead person's still buzzing mind and can't read further. A line tethers me to the page. Then from the line, what is it? Some little creature, a little winged flying thing. Hello. Are you my ancestor again? It shakes its tiny head. What about hope? Is your name hope? It squeaks the softest note. And of course, it's not feathered like that. This guy's flat, squat, and all around roach-like bug. Size of a size shrug, flimsily flitting about. Sorry, he says, to disappoint. Though you must be used to that by now. And he lands, settles on my left hand, perhaps to dedicate all his remaining energy to speech. Didn't you say, he goes on, you don't want the journey called life, you want to live. Doesn't that mean, however hopeless, however grief, however rage and sleepless, however alive? The little bug, he doesn't wait for my answer. Just, just gives me one tiny itchy kiss and disappears. And the last one I'll read following this series. <clears throat> it's called February. February. An urgency, a pungency, a welling up wafting through the living room. Hey, is someone cooking up a big old pot of despair? Want a taste, says my partner from the kitchen. Weird, says my ancestor from their ancestral ethnic enclave. He's never made something so funky or asked you to taste before he's finished the whole dish. Très, très weird. Shush, I say, and then yes. My partner comes into the room with a spoon, a spoonful of this oniony, garlicky, is it agony? Is it stew? It's something true, says the hot spoonful in my mouth, on my tongue. Haven't you realized, the flavor continues. Once you were hopelessly in love, which made you hopeful for the world. Now you're both hopeless, but not ever loveless. Now you love the world of each other even more, even when it is a bitter love. Weird, Nespa. Savor it, the taste of his falling deeper into despair. Yes, you can taste it, though you may not ever know it. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Chen. Oh, it happened so fast. <laughs> oh. How you doing, Carla? You ready to read? Well, I'm just, um, I think I'm going to put it on gallery view so I can see, pretend like I'm in person um, seeing all of you. I just want to sit, take a moment to just really thank these readers. Oh my God. Um, all of you, um, Chen, Seema, Victor, Jaira. I am so honored to be in the same place a uh, virtual place, <laughs> same reading as all of you. Thank you so much for gifting me with your presence. 
Um, I I'm going to do some quick thank yous because I, I want to get to reading. I know you don't want to hear an hour worth of this is not the Academy Awards. Um, but um, thank you so much to City of West Hollywood's WeHo Reads and their poet laureate, the fabulous Brian Sonia Wallace, who's an incredible poet as well. Um, to my publisher, Christy Bowen, Dancy Girl Press, and the editors who worked on this collection, Jennifer Sweeney and Diana Rico. And I would say shine the light on him somewhere for, for the cover and interior photos, Gabriel Johnson, my beloved son. Um, there are so many people that contribute to a book, all the talented writers who inspire and offer feedback. Um, so please buy my book and read the acknowledgements um, for more so I can get to the reading. <laughs> okay. I also want to say a thank you to my dear partner, Milo. Whew, almost forgot that one. Hey, Carla, I didn't actually read your bio yet. Can I do that while you're- Sure. The, the well, thing? Sure. We, we have it for posterity for the recording. Um, so Carla Samith is the author of What is Left, which is what we're here to celebrate the birth of from Dancing Girl Press, as well as the memoir One Day on the Gold Line, uh, published in 2019 with the reissue forthcoming by Golden Foothills Press in 2022. So look out for that. Her writing on blended, unblended, queer, multiracial, and single parent families appears in a variety of literary journals and anthologies. Her work has twice been named as a notable essay of the year in Best American Essays. She is a Pasadena Rose poet, a West Hollywood pride poet, and a former Penn teaching artist. Uh, she also teaches creative writing to high school and university students and incarcerated youth. Carla, can't wait to hear from your book. Okay. Drive a stake into the art of lamenting. Don't wait for the virus to set in. A mere pause is like sharing spit or like having your wallet stolen with all your kids' pictures. Stay six feet away from regrets and be sure to sterilize after thinking about the future. Before putting on a mask, clean possums and drink alcohol or soap and water, cover mouth and nose with dirty pictures and think of Santa Claus, but younger. Avoid eating the mask while using it. Cross yourself and pick up your dry cleaning next August. Make brownies with hand sanitizer. Print the mask with your 3D printer as soon as it is damp and do not steal any bases. To remove the mask, walk to your nearest 7-Eleven. Do not touch the front of your wife's chest. Discard your worries in a closed bin. Clean your fantasy with a Lysol wipe. Take an online course in the lost art of compartmentalization. At the end of the day, be glad you woke up. Make sure I got my list. That's a good one. Baby in store pickup. Some of us kind of got a little wonky during this period of time. Baby in store pickup. They ignore the profits, but remind us we must inject our Lysol twice daily. Tell us, we've got your back. Women on television ad paces back and forth across the screen, same outfit, no mask, while narrator drones. Fidelity is here to help you through the unexpected. But we do believe Judy Woodruff. Each night when PBS NewsHour ends, she reminds us, stay safe, as my wife and I wave goodbye from our sofa. There are new ads now, in-store pickup. Make the most of your outdoor space while at home. But on my side patio, ma'am, the gardenia newly planted wilts with the first heat wave and collapses, drowned after failed revival attempt. Let this be the worst thing that happened in these times, I tell my 96-year-old aunt. She remembers gardenias were given as sweet-smelling corsages. I remember tucking one behind the ear of a beautiful woman passing by as she trimmed banana trees with her machete. The white flower, bold and delicate scent of possibilities. Baby in store pickup, the screen says oddly. My eyes see messages no one else sees, wanting to believe the good news. But when I go to order it unshipped, they tell me they are out. 
I'd wanted so many more. No substitutions. Don't want a kitten, puppy, or baby snake, or even the little mice they feed the snake. Staring at my phone, waiting for answers, I wonder how long a mother can live without the touch of a son. What if she's one of those who gets sick, dies alone, his last words barely heard, and he too tires of it all? How long? That answer is not for sale. Try the New York Times crossword puzzle, or maybe free things on Craigslist if that still exists. Antibacterial wipes, they're all out of those today. If I could pick one up in store, how would I sanitize the baby? Now we are house cats, confined to our corners, dependent upon whatever being is around to feed us, clean our shit, and cuddle up with us, but only when we feel like it. They say that it is for our own good, which is what we told our cat, Princessa, when we wouldn't let her out to frolic with the neighborhood feral cats who came knocking about. That coyotes, cars, and fleas, an untimely end await her if she ventures out, but she does escape now and then returns to throw up the gobbled grass. We stand at the door and scratch at the windows, yowl for release, escape for short walks, now swathed with uncrafty cloth that shows only our eyes. We blink and smile unseen, waving to the other outdoor creatures. Today it is pissing down torrents of rain so we, can rem so we remain inside, seen only by screens that tell us to stretch, breathe, and if we watch the news, to be very afraid. We all had different challenges, those of us with kids, the people who had little kids at home and they were trying to work and the people who had adult children who they were trying to figure out what was safe in terms of how and what way they could see them. Not hand in hand. And so we walked, not hand in hand, but 10 steps behind or six feet across. I carried this child inside for nine months after hoping for years for the baby that lived, and he did. But now the world split open, separating a mother from son six feet apart. The refrain cannot stop the urge to touch, and when we say goodbye, he reaches across and grabs a hug. Mask to mask, we touch. I'm sorry, mom, I couldn't help it, he says the grief of recoiling from your son. What of the child you've kept alive, his life blown apart, out of work, and imagining all the possibilities, Berlin to Amsterdam, Portland to New Orleans? What are these dreams that grab him hard and call him out now whispering, don't wait too long? You bring him Filipino chicken soup, you bring him green beans and black bean sauce, stir-fried scallops, rice, masks, toilet paper, sanitizer, and a prayer. When he says that he must listen, his passion, study, travel, and would I be happy if he was working as a barista with a college degree, I surprise myself acting as my parents, wanting to argue for security. Instead, we are our grandparents, talking of rationing and lines, and all we need are pogroms. Here they pummel the Asians with racist rants. My friends are scared. And white Americans can't seem to tell the difference between Filipino, Korean, Chinese, or Japanese. I'm sorry if I'm lumping them all in one place, they white people. And my son asks, mom, didn't you want to travel? Didn't you want to learn? Remember when you said you'd be too old if you studied medicine, you'd be 30 something anyway. And then you were that age anyway. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I'm going to just ask, do people know what taking it to the ninth means? I'm going to give you an, so I played trumpet. I was, I was a good trumpet player when I was, I was first chair uh, when I was 17, but um, I didn't play for about 45 years and, and my partner gifted me trumpet lessons. Um, so now I'm playing again and it's, it's not, it kind of scares our dog. Um, 
So by taking it to the ninth, one goes beyond the more comfortable tonalities that exist when the player stops at the eighth degree of the major scale. Taking it to the ninth adds a bit of tension that makes music so much more interesting. Then it can resolve, if so desired, back to the eighth degree, the octave, and the tension is resolved. Tension and release is really a fundamental aspect of all great music, but in jazz even more so. The listener doesn't have to know what is happening theoretically, but they can still tell something is going on. That's Bill Big, my wonderful trumpet teacher. Each day, asking myself, is it happy hour yet? Today, only 3.50 p.m., and I couldn't quite get those 16th notes right. Take it to the ninth, my trumpet teacher tells me. And we don't know if you'll be wearing a mask or hoping for a spare ventilator or simply scrounging for the right ingredients, faring much better than those folks living in the tent cities. Your wife steps around each day on the way to work her shit job. It seems we might all take it to the ninth. And yet the lips tire out and the breath gets short, too short to hit the high notes, anything above an E. Really, let's be honest. They say in Ecuador, the bodies are just lying on the street, my wife tells me in the morning. And walking across the street, mouth and nose covered by makeshift masks, we aren't makers. No sourdough starter here. This is inverted underwear. We are almost hit by a car. She pulls me back and the blue Ford F-350 speeds through the red light. What about the foster kids who aged out and have nowhere to go, I ask, and my wife says she can't think of one more thing to worry about. I imagine soon everyone will take it to the ninth if they are still alive and believe that the high notes still matter. Is it happy hour yet? Almost 4 p.m., but the phone stays surly silent. Wife will arrive later, dispose of clothes, sterilize first, hope she hasn't brought anything home. Later, give me a kiss. Instagram has cocktail hours and virtual dance parties I don't attend. Instead, I wonder where are all my friends? Know the truth. I'm sure I'm not the only one seeking oblivion. And what if there is no longer a proper way to end a poem, epics that just go on and on? Still, you can't help but hope that inspiration will beat out boredom. And you won't be too damn hot behind that balaclava mask come summer to take it to the ninth. My wife offers to give my son one of her balaclavas only to realize a young black man wearing one is a target, just like when he was holding the huge wire cutters to break into our garage. That time our key was in Europe and kittens were being birthed inside. It's 4.05 p.m. I'm waiting for an invite. I read the warning label. Watch out for signs of virus fatigue, like drinking alone early in the day and cutting everything up in your house to make masks so you'll never leave the house again. Hang on. This poem is partially, um, I have to give Victor some credit for it because we, we were working together as pride poets and he, he told me, think about your son when you wake up. I was talking about how I felt this fear in the morning. June, 2020, alarm goes off. Clutch wife, remember to breathe. Remember George Floyd. Fear floods in, room congested. A poet wrote me a poem that tells me, think of your son when you first wake up. And I do, but terror for the risk to his soul, his body, his black skin. This mom's heart is tumbling, even with wife opening the curtain, singing me, good morning, good morning. Wild parrots and cascading Pasadena bird song, cat kneading and purring. Even then cannot calm when wife gets up to leave. See three missed calls last night probably just son telling me about latest protests. He made me laugh at the Highland Park March when he said, mom, look, that white woman, full black panther regalia, knee high black boots, 
black coveralls and beret fist raised, standing in front of that MLK mural on the wall of that hipster coffee shop. Would that be her Instagram post? The woman, she just looked at me, just said, your life matters. Yes, it does, son. And I imagine telling him this every day, what I've always told him, his life means. But the words sink into fear, get stuck in the throat, legs still glued to the bed, mind gripped by galloping thoughts, I pull the blanket over my head. What is left? One, my rind is being peeled away, more naked than I've ever been, yet on Zoom appear fully clothed. I am fully clothed. Lie about our scraped interiors, about our breaking down exterior that can't be seen because the corridors of the emergency rooms are filled with people who can't breathe and corpses that cannot leave because there is no space for more burials. The refrigerated trucks wait as if delivering perishables. I want to tell them my heart beats too fast and I don't know how much longer silver linings can last. Two, give me a chance to tell you what is sweet from that unseen place if the time hasn't passed. Hope that I'm not all dry inside, the moisture sucked out by age and fright. Give me a chance to show you what I'm made of, allspice, nutmeg, cinnamon, whatever is left, orange rind. Throw it all in there, even if there is nothing to crunch between teeth. Find the softness beneath. Fresh fruit and vegetables picked by those with nothing, no masks, no gloves, no social distancing, and soon no job. Here in America, the food is tossed, the farmers lament, but it costs too much to harvest and feed those who starve. Takes too much to keep that 75 year old with a bad kidney alive when the 30 year old who once had a life ahead is choking. Three, at 69, I'm one of the expendables. I get that. After all, I've lived my life, had my child, loved my loves, but still I want to hold that grandchild, caress my wife, kiss my son. Time doesn't feel quite up. I hold on to your hand against the screen. Words tumble unceremoniously onto, into your lap. I love you. I miss you. I don't want to die without hugging you one more time. And I'm just going to read one last one that might, the title might be something that we're all feeling still as things just go on into new stages with this pandemic. Unspooled. Sometimes I feel as if I'm undone. A big spool of yarn rolling down a steep hill and out into the street, down the garbage gathered drain. Other times I'm standing in front of Ramon's apartment building in the day after. Remember when I broke that bottle of tequila herradura? It shattered in big shards and little slivers. Híjole, y fue uno de los buenos. The doorman lamented, watching the smooth white liquid spill onto the sidewalk, lost. I wonder would they say that about me as I fall and crash to smithereens? I want to laugh out loud when I see I'm as solid as a snow cone, as if I could be slurped up, tossed out, or simply melt away, as if I could be a sweetness craved, a crying child's dream on steaming summer days. Prescription, wrap arms tightly around chest. Imagine freshly, freshly baked hala. Imagine a Friday night when you allow yourself to rest your shredded senses and put on that white lace Brazilian dress. Do not think of shards. Think instead of strong vigas, high ceilings, an unobstructed view of the Big Dipper. Leonard Cohen carrying your darkness in his secret chords. Sing hallelujah. Sing he nene, I am here. Thank you.
So beautiful. Thank you so much, Carla. If everyone wants to go ahead and unmute and just make some noise for Woo! Carla, please. It yeah. is launched. It is launched. All right, we're going to go into a little bit of a Q&A now. I'm going to kick things off, but if anyone has anything that they would like to know about the book, about Carla's writing and process, um, if you just go ahead and use the raise hand function on your screen or let me know in the chat, I'll make sure that we get to those questions. And we've got um, it's about 15 minutes to kind of get to talk about the book and, and celebrate it now that we've heard a little bit of, of what it sounds like. Um, whew, that ending, I love the journey that you brought us on through that. Um, I guess my, my initial question, Carla, I keep changing my mind about what it's going to be, but we talked a lot about the order and you were talking about um, kind of choosing the order for these poems. And I feel like you, you gave us such a journey, such a trajectory. And I wonder if you can just speak to how you chose how to order them for, for us here today. Oh, well, I kept choosing and choosing and going through. And I kept ending with the feeling that we're still all feeling a bit unspooled. Um, and we're still asking ourselves what is left when we come out. Um, and I guess I kind of wanted to start with where we where we just landed that weird place that March of 2020. Um, we just sort of plopped down into this other world and, and all the things that went with it. Um, you know, having a 25 year old son who didn't live with us. So we had to figure out what, what, how, you know, the whole idea of not even being able to hug the people you love or, um, so I think it just sort of went along a similar journey. They're slightly different order than what they were written. Um, the title poem was actually written a little bit earlier, but it seemed to be a poem that was one that I would want towards the end today, because I think there's a lot of us that are asking that question now, what is left? And it's such a, it relates so much to the, the first question that we talked about when we talked about what these questions were gonna look like, um, which is just the, the most obnoxious question that I can ask. So I have to get it out of the way up front. Um, which is why, why do we need pandemic poems right now? And I feel like, you know, what we talked about, you kind of hit on it, that idea that we're in this new stage, but I love the verb plopped. We plopped into, into this moment. Um, but I think because a lot of them are written, a lot of the pandemic poems that have come out are written in real time. Whereas usually, you know, I originally was a memoirist is what I started out as. And you always like, you need that reflection. Like part of memoir is reflection, having a little bit of time to look <clears throat> back and see what you think of things from the desk of now. And that wasn't the case with these pandemic poems that a lot of us have written and published. We're just writing them and we're putting them out. And so it's kind of a time capsule of what we were experiencing right then. And I think it's also like that, you know, those who are in some kind of anonymous 12 step program I've heard that you know those silly slogans you see on the bumper stickers like this too shall pass and it turns out those are actually nice things to think about um so i think it also does say to us this too shall pass we don't know what's next but some of what we some of what um i wrote about in the earlier poems like changed you know in terms of what we um i mean most of us never really thought about shooting up uh lysol but um, so, I mean, I think, um, the pandemic poems, like other poems that are written in the moment, they, they take you to that place of rawness. Like, I mean, I don't know, and, and, and not everybody probably wants to hear them. So I hope this wasn't a bummer for everybody, but. <laughs> well, it looks like Brian is having some technical difficulties. So, um, Nima, I see your hand is up if you want to ask your question. Do we, do we need, Hi. oh, sorry. Hey, Carla, congratulations again. Um, just wanna say that 
um, well, that I'm, it's, it's such a thrill to hear how you've um, worked on your poems from the last time that we, we workshopped it and everything and to hear the story behind it and yet still to find something new um, in what you've rewritten basically. Um, I guess my question was, um, how do you know when you are happy with the rewrite? Like from our workshop, I've rewritten um, some of my stuff and I can't seem to be satisfied. And is it, does that mean I just need to keep working on it more or just pushing it and everything or like, I mean, aside from, I guess, the, the physical deadline, right? <laughs> Looming or whatever that you need to turn in. Um, or like, how do you know when to stop that? Okay, this is either done for now or I'm going to go back to it and then, um, and then, you know, say that it's finished or do you, is it a poem that you're going to keep going back to? Well, I, I bet the other poets might who, who read would also have an answer for this, but I think sometimes we think that they're done and then we keep revising. So I'm working on a bigger collection now and um, definitely these poems, some of the poems that were finished for this chapbook are um, being revised still. Mm -hmm. um, I see someone in the audience, Andres, who once told me, watch over editing because it can take away some of the rawness of the, of the poems. Um, so it's always, I think, kind of a balance of knowing when to stop. But I mean, how many poets here raise your hands who have written poems and then find yourself changing them later for, you know, to be published somewhere else or a different collection? Yeah. I see a couple hands. So I think it's it's hard to tell. How's that for a vague and helpful answer? Anyone else want to chime in on that? Jen, what do you say about that? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, I can chime in, definitely. Um, yeah, it's such a journey. Um, I mean, I remember some of these ones from workshop, and then um, when you sent me the manuscripts again um, more recently and got to revisit them. And yeah, I think it's a constant, I mean, I'm going through finishing, um, still working some edits on my forthcoming book. Um, and it's always so messy, I feel, and unpredictable, right? The whole writing and revising process, um, you know, from the individual poem to then thinking about how the poems are in conversation with one another as a collection, and then sort of revising each of them, you know, toward that as well. And just hearing them, you know, as a small group tonight, I think it was evident to everybody, you know, how much you know, the poems were building on one another, you know, thematically, but also in terms of the voice, in terms of some of the formal choices, some of the endings. Um, and so just great to see how the poems grew together. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for some wonderful feedback, you and our other workshop members. Uh, I see we have a question. Diana, you have your hand up. Hi, Carla, it's so moving to hear you read these. Um, yeah, I'm very moved. And all the poets, I'm grateful for all of your poems and, and, and what you read and the way you read them. They were really beautiful. Um, I wonder if you could just share with people the backstory to the cover of the book, because I know about it and it's just so beautifully organic uh, to the whole of the work. Oh my and God. Hold it up so we can all see it. It's so beautiful. Thank you for saying that. And Diana Rico and Jennifer Sweeney are two people who are editors on this for this book. So thank you. Um, can you can you all see it? Um, I don't know if you can, Gabriel, are you? Unmute yourself a sec, Gabriel, where are you? 
Um, so this picture was taken by my son took um, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't see you. Are you on the phone? I can't I can't spotlight him because he's his camera is off. <laughs> oh, put your camera on. Put your camera on Gabe for a moment, please. It's on. It hey. is? Yeah. No, it is. Oh, okay. Can you spotlight him? How you do that? Hold on. I'm trying, but it's not here. Now I can. Yes, I can. There you go. Okay. Son, my son is a wonderful okay. photographer and he had these series of photos um, that like, this is a, the Broadway bridge, right? Um, Gabe? Yes. Yes. Just uh, north of downtown. And it's not usually that empty, is it? No, no. I think that was maybe earlier last year, later, um, it was like December last year. So, or maybe was last year, yeah, 2020, right? Yes, yeah. yes. We was, yeah. December. yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's a couple pictures on the interior of this too that also that Gabriel took, but it was just really striking how that's not a view you see of of LA usually that empty like that just that lone bicyclist and now I don't even Diana I don't even remember exact I just remember saying this picture I feel like this is a good match for this book like I feel like it says it all and oh. so anyway thank you so much thank it you just, beautiful writing love you me too <laughs> Right. Um, it looks Carla, like Brian is back, so I'm going to spotlight him. Okay. Um, and I see a, a hand raised here. June. I know Thelma, Thelma and June looks like had questions. Okay. Um, sorry about um, that. Of course, internet goes out at the worst possible moment. Carla, if you're able to make me a co-host again, I can keep doing those those duties. Yeah. Um, but go ahead, June. Uh, hello from China, greetings from China. <laughs> I am actually, uh, I am just so happy to be um, invited to this event by Zoe. Congratulations, Carla, for, for your book. And, and it's, uh, I, I know it's, a, it's such a meaningful thing. If I am in my second hotel quarantine. It's a total 28 days um, of quarantine. And uh, to hear all of your beautiful poets reading is really such a gift. Uh, and um, I have written, the moment I came to China, actually I started to write poems in, 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 in Chinese and I wrote uh, some quarantine poems in Chinese. I hope to share it sometime soon. I just want to also take this rare opportunity to give you a glimpse of China as I am quarantined, see? This, I mean, the city of Nanjing, this is a famous purple gold mountain outside of my window. Uh, Nanjing wow. is a city of many times, uh, the capital of China. And uh, underneath here is the old people's home, which I've been peeking into every day, their lives. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, and the people are, well, see, this is a gate of the home and the families will come to visit their beloved ones. Um, they are freer than us now uh, in, in certain senses, but I'm certainly not free. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, just, just want to share this with you guys and thank you all. Um, thanks to all of the poets, Chen Chen, Victor, Jura. And uh, yes, congratulations to you all. For, for your creativity here in this most challenging time. Thank and you I so you much. <laughs> I look Sorry. forward to come back next spring to see you all. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad thank you're, you. you're willing to step out of quarantine well no you can't sorry so that you're able to tune in <laughs> I, I cannot step out of this door and everything is delivered to my to my door and and there's no you know I, I, i've been in two different hotel rooms but my sister managed to sneak in some flowers for me oh 
And I, my friend in San Francisco gave me this little margarita before I left. <laughs> Anyways. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. So. There is a poem in my Thank you. Thank you. There's a poem, The Kindness of People in These Times. I have a poem in there about um, when two people showed up to, and dropped off unexpected surprises. Um, I, I don't know if Felicity is still here, but you were one of them. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> that, that great. Thank you. <laughs> I know, um, Thelma, you had raised a, a real hand instead of a virtual hand. Did you have a question you want to you want to throw in? I, I I don't know if I know how to do the virtual hand thing. I'm I'm not uh, that uh, that that adept with Zoom. But yeah, I, 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 was, uh, I, I just wanted to throw in a, a, a reminder. Uh, Walt Whitman, the great American poet who is sometimes referred to as a father of modern American poetry, Emily Dickinson was in that group too. Um, his, uh, his masterpiece, Leaves of Grass, went through nine editions. He was always redoing it, redoing it, redoing it. And the final one, was called the deathbed edition because he passed away soon after that. So I think he's a great example of someone who didn't know when to stop editing and revising. So he just kept on. But but Carla, you mentioned that you're you're preparing a a, a full length collection or a longer collection of poetry. That that's going to be your next. Uh, did I hear right? And I I was just curious about that. Um. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Pa I paused because I saw a question in the chat. We'll get um. Yes, um, I'm working on a full length collection um, and I'm working slowly through it. I'm giving myself permission to do slow, slow edits. Um, so, and I'm about to embark on a month long residency in New Mexico in February. Um, so hopefully I will, um, I will have some time to work on it then. Yeah. It's gonna be great. Thank you so much. Um, I see there's a question in here um, from, who was that question? From, from Jennifer. Uh, should I read it? I'll go ahead and read it for you yeah. and then you can respond. Thank you. <laughs> it says there's a surprising levity in the poems. Even if it feels like gallows laughter, the absurdity of our adaptation, adaption is captured. Did writing the poems help you move through it, process it, and find your foothold amidst it all? Oh, hell yes. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I would survive without humor. Um, I feel like that's something that um, is part of kind of my genetic makeup, ethnic heritage. <laughs> um, and um, there's so much in my life that I don't think I would have survived without it. I, I don't, I, I think that my son, who I just adore, who is probably still here, we might have killed each other at some point if we didn't have humor. Um, same is true for, for my parents and all of us. So um, it definitely helped me move through it because there was so much that was so absurd too with what we were dealing with, right? I mean, that he who shall not be named in, in charge of the country, or, you know, there, there was just so much that was surreal. And um, there were some moments where humor was hard to find. I'm sure you all felt that, where tears were a lot, where I really, tears were the most appropriate response. I just kept thinking about that song by Lil Wayne, Mess. My life is a mess, My, you know, like, when things were really bad, listening to that song and just having a glass of wine and shedding a few tears. This is kind of a, a related question that I had um, and apologies for, for the Christmas light power outage um, and return. Um, so I've missed some of the conversation, uh, but you talk in each day about this idea of seeking oblivion. Um, and it got me thinking about writing as maybe an encounter with oblivion. Like some people, you know, drown themselves in one thing or another and, and feeling like you've turned to writing. So I wonder if you would agree with the idea that writing is an encounter with oblivion um, and, and why or why not? Mm. 
I think we're, we all have different like places that we're at when we write, you know, and sometimes it's just the only thing we can do. And we're, it's as if we're in another place. I wouldn't call it oblivion exactly. Um, I, 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 but it's, but it's, um, we're transported to another place temporarily. Like all of you who are writers here probably have had the experience where you write something and then you go back and read it. You're like, God, I don't even remember writing that. Like, where did that come from? I don't recognize that but I guess I did write it. Um, so I think, um, I, 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 yes, I wouldn't call it exactly oblivion. And, and I'm open to hear if anyone else has um, any other thoughts on that. Um, but I think it is a form of, of transporting ourselves away from the place that we find ourselves stuck sometimes. I just, because I have to do this for all words now, um, I looked at the etymology for oblivion and it comes from the, rat, the Latin word for forgetting. So ah. maybe it's the opposite of oblivion. Um, I mean, like you said, the, the somewhere else, but it's also like this book is such a powerful act of remembering. Okay, I guess in that sense, it can take the form when you're really, really engrossed in what you're writing, you are sort of blotting out whatever else might be upset you might be obsessing about so it is a kind it can be a kind of escape you know in that way but you know we have so many different ways we write from you know i mean certainly editing is not oblivion um <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe something but it's not oblivion um we just have time for for a couple more questions so if folks do want to jump in feel free to raise your hands um, I'll ask, uh, you talk about taking it to the ninth, and I love that poem so much, and the ninth being a tonality that kind of shifts us beyond our comfort zone. And I wonder um, what you are taking to the ninth right now, either in your, your life or your writing. Hmm. I think what I'm trying to take to the ninth is, is the ability to live in the in-between spaces. Um, to be able to not have to say, okay, I am a memoirist, I am a poet, I write fiction, you know, but to be able to, to be in those in-between spaces or to say, even in regards to my family, um, if you read the book, I talk about my wife. Um, my wife is a trans man. And so we're also in the in-between spaces. And we also at the same time, well, he's going through transition, we adopted a St. Bernard. So our family is growing and morphing in strange ways. Um, and again, to be comfortable with, you know, being in the in-between spaces, you know, um, I'm queer. So now I'm married to a trans man. We're still queer. Um, <laughs> But to be okay with um, definitions being a little more fluid, um, and and I think I am. Um, so for me, that's really pushing, like being being comfortable in those places that lack. If they don't lack, they lack definition or they lack naming sometimes, and and that's the same thing that happens to us with writing sometimes too, like. We, we want that word so badly. Now that happens more as we get older. So those of us who are in my age range really understand this. But, you know, being comfortable with waiting for the right word to come to us. Um, or you can get on the computer and look at thesaurus and see if something comes up. I, yeah. And I feel like there was something else when you asked me that earlier about taking it to the ninth, but I can't remember what it was. Um, I mean, in a way playing trumpet again because I used to be first chair I was like the best at it and now I'm like I tried to play I started to play with this um gay freedom band um and there a lot of them are professionals and I'm you know give me the fourth trumpet part you know at best we did we did have a ton of requests to see and possibly hear from the trumpet but that's up to you whether that's something you're willing to do on this uh... I'm not willing to take it to the ninth today. <laughs> not that ninth, other ninths, many other ninths. Um, beautiful. And uh, I'll ask one, one last thing, and we can just play with this uh, a little bit um, and then thank everybody for, for coming out and spending some of their Sunday afternoon, evening, wherever they are with us. Um, this idea of kind of the role of a poet in 
these times and you know you had your your memoir was your last sort of collection that you you were working on and so this is a different form that you're working in and I'm curious what you're thinking about the role of the poet the things that came to my mind as I was reading were the poet as a documentarian the poet as storyteller but also maybe the poet as prophet um or maybe the poet as whistleblower or detonator <laughs> the poet Scav as a person a scavenger person. sorry go ahead oh a scavenger of detonator too i love that i was going to um, say the poet is person who doesn't drink enough water the poet who doesn't drink enough water yeah oh there we go the Jeez. poet the poet as town crier or thief maybe um mm -hmm. Some people think poet as prophet, but I think that's a little lofty. Um, I like the 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 detonator whistleblower image. I think that's great. What are you what are you detonating in this collection? <laughs> I'm detonating the reality, you know, the the idea that um, that anything about this time has been normal. For, it's been our normal, but it is our normal, and normal keeps changing. Hmm. I have to think about that question a little bit more, because I, I like, yeah, that's probably one of my favorite ideas as detonator. Um, I mean, hopefully, when we write poetry, that like most of us aim to surprise, you know, right? and to really rupture in some ways what people, you want both connection and rupture, rupture like preconceived notions and connection, like, yeah, I get that, you know, I, I feel that. I, I, that's, I kept wanting to say that over and over again when I heard the other poets reading. And maybe there's something to the idea of connection and rupture not being opposites, like them being entwined with each other, that we need a rupture to have that connection, or we need connection. Yeah, we need connection for there to be something to rupture. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> um, on that note, Carla, can I share a, a piece that I um, wrote for, for you from... <sighs> um all of the readers who read tonight and the work that you read and some of the things that were said around it um it's a little found poem um just to kind of close off the night and then if we can uh make sure that we share the link to order again in the chat um if you send carla uh copies of your receipts showing that you've ordered the chat book i can neither confirm nor deny uh, that you may get a custom poem. We're doing kind of a raffle, like of a custom poem, and it might be by me, it might be by Brian or uh, Jira. Um, it could be by, you, you'll be surprised. Um, and I actually will, if you order through this link, I'll know that you all have your name, so you don't have to worry. Yes. Okay. So Send Carla your receipts to be to be entered into that raffle. Yeah. Beautiful. And this was the the um, summation poem from the readings tonight. My mouth has been the exit wound. Checked boxes like blood on the leaves, the ungrateful orchids, the cluttered exuberance of my dumb human life. Glad for your company. One tiny itchy kiss. You love the world of each other more, even when it's a bitter love. Be sure to sterilize before thinking about the future. How would I sanitize the baby? Didn't you want to travel? What if there's no proper way to end a poem? I don't want to die without hugging you one more time. I am fully clothed. <laughs> Bravo. That's wonderful. I have to get a copy of that. That was so amazing. 
you all have been an incredible audience. I'm so grateful that you came here. It's we're all so burned out. A lot of us are burned out on Zoom. And so thank you for spending your time with us this evening. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, I think you're muted, Brian. Thank you all for coming. And with that, there's only one more to do. Let me get it up really quickly. Oh, shoot. Should have had this prepared. Oh, a map for me. What else do they need to? Did we lose you? No, you're muted again, Brian. Unmute. There we go. This is what I wanted to do. It'll be anticlimactic, but here it is. Thank you all for coming. That concludes this Weho Read reading of Carlos Samick. What is left? Thank you to all of our readers. Thank you to the City of West Hollywood for supporting this. Thank you to all of you for coming out. And we can't to see you at the next one. Lovely. Hi, Andres and Lisa and Jan and Zoe. Hi, Hello, everyone. Tracy. Congratulations again. Uh, this is like romper room. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Kamana. My fourth grade teacher is here. Hi, Zoe. Uh, Hi, Gina and Katie and Margo and Terry and Angel and Julie and Karen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. If I, Sammy.